So lastly, I'd like to invite uh, Ajahn Sumedho to uh, offer his reflections, and then again we'll have a, a little period of time for some questions uh, following that. Writer's reflection on monkeys are like that is is, is very much uh, also what I've uh, learned living with uh, him in Thailand and from Thailand itself. Because uh, when I went there, I was a very idealistic person and uh, had very high standards of of what I wanted and for myself and for everyone else and. So it was this incredible idealism that I was very attached to. And then, of course, I couldn't live up to it, and no, no one else could. <laughs> <laughs> but this is part of an American uh, karma, isn't it? We're very idealistic, and, and then because of that, very critical of ourselves and uh, everything else. And the thing that, that impressed me in Thailand itself was because it is Buddhist country. It, it, it is it's not. They're not particularly idealistic. They, they, they have this sense of this is the way the world is, and uh, this is you know to want it to be otherwise is, is to create suffering because, it can't be the way you want it. It's just the way it is. And you know this obviously is just common sense. <laughs> It didn't really dawn on me until I, <laughs> until I, uh, I really lived with Lumpur Cha. And I remember one, uh, this was before I met Lumpur Cha, I was in Nongkai. And, and at that time, Nongkai is a province across the Mekong River from Laos. And, and at, at that time, Laos was still, uh, this is 1966, so it was still uh, not communist. Part of it, the northern part was, but uh, Vientiane and that area was still under the royal Lao government. So I, mean, I was in meditation, and I hear these rumors, and one of them was that a, a, gen, a Lao general from a southern town called uh, Savanakhet went up and bombed, because he got angry with the general up in Vientiane, went up and bombed the, the military base. And uh, so when I heard this, I thought, this is stupid. And so Thai monk came and I was talking to him about this. I said, this is really a stupid thing to have done. And, and the monk says, yes, it is, but it's the way life is. <laughs> 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 and, something, <laughs> and something in me, you know, all my indignation, suddenly I started seeing that, you know, I, I had this view it shouldn't be like this. And, and, uh, and, and so it was a kind of awakening to looking at life as experience rather than from the ideals of how it should be. And living with Lung Po Cha was very much uh, that kind of training because, uh, you know, when, when I went there, of course, I was, I still had, you know, I wanted, I wanted this ideal place, this uh, perfect monastery and, and uh, enlightened teacher. And, and of course, when I went there, when you're when you're kind of hold, holding on to the ideals, you you tend to see that in a way. You convince yourself this is really the best place, and and Ajahn Chah is the best teacher. But then, as that kind of del illusion fades away, you get you yeah, can do a critical mode because you start noticing it doesn't quite live up to the ideal, and and in many ways it's far from it. So then then I'd start suffering, you know, thinking, I, this isn't right, they shouldn't do it like this. So this critical mind, uh, he was very good at getting me to see. Uh, and because of the, the others have, have pointed this out, someone with that kind of pure presence is, is really a mirror. Uh, because that, I noticed living with him, uh, being around him, that uh, things would drop very quickly. It's like he was a mirror for me. And so sometimes I'd wind myself up, and 
with my critical mind thinking, I don't like this, and that he shouldn't be allowing this, and and I'd get, get I'm going to tell Ajahn Chan, I'd go over to his kuti, uh, and and as soon as I'd arrive and I'd see him, suddenly all this would drop, you know. All my criticisms and problems seemed to to just cease, and this was, I began to notice this, you know, here I convinced myself this these were real problems, and yet, in when I actually uh, had the opportunity to address this with him, I, I, I didn't need to anymore. And this happened many times. In, uh, in I was the first Western monk uh, there, and that was uh, 1967, so there was a huge American presence at Air Force Base in Ubon, and, uh, and it was a uh, place where they, the Americans were bombing Hanoi, northern Vietnam, because that area is very close to Hanoi, quite near to Vietnam. And so, uh, the people, the local people were so in awe of the Americans, you know, they, they, in the, they were very influenced a lot, they loved Elvis Presley movies, and their view of Americans was such that they thought we were all like that, you know, we. We'd break out in song and dance on the street, <laughs> and they ride big m motorcycles around in Zoom, and and uh, they seem so kind of all rich and wealthy. And so, so then uh, when I became a monk with Ajahn Chah, then this the the local people were were stunned by this, and they'd come from miles around just to look at me, <laughs> like. Like a monkey, you know, they, <laughs> like I was a, some kind of exhibit, and and then when I'd go into a bit on the arms rounds, I, I'd always hear this this background of prapfrang, prapfrang, you know, and this just means foreign monk, and and these things, you know, this sense of being such a center of attention, uh, I found very irritating at first. I was making a problem about it, and then. Uh, then Thai people tended to, you know, they were wondering why an American who, who could, you know, live in such comfort and wealth and sing and dance on the street and ride a big <laughs> motorcycle would want to live with Ajahn Chah. I mean, <laughs> <'cause> they, <laughs> they said, you know, not, not even the Thais want to live with him. <laughs> <laughs> And he said, and it was the co co common custom in Ubo, and they think one uh, these rain periods, rain when they call the Pansa in Thai, the or the Wasa season, the rainy season, where the custom is in Thailand is he, every man before he gets married should have at least uh, a Pansa, three months as a monk. Uh, and so uh, during this time, you know, people would people would say, well. We figure out that one panza with Lung Pa Chat Wat Ba Pong is worth at least 20 years of being a monk in any other monastery. <laughs> and even the head monk of the province, uh, Ubon province, uh, was against me being there. He, he was very, he seemed to be very critical and averse to uh, Lung Pa Cha. And he tried to convince me to leave. And so, they thought, they thought Americans should study Abhidhamma. They got this idea we're all very intelligent. And, and, that, <laughs> and that, we, <laughs> that we're so advanced that we should study the advanced teaching, like the, this Abhidhamma. Uh, and that's the last thing I wanted to study, actually, was, was anything on that level, uh, because uh, I was just filled to the brim with knowledge and I was kind of bursting with with having read too many books, too much information. And so when I went to stay with Lung Po Cha, I, he said, uh, don't read anything. He said, this Pan Sa, you know, don't read any books, just practice. And so he kept saying, just practice. And so I was relieved, I thought, at last, you know, he's not going to make me read something or learn something, just practice. His way of teaching was, well, it was direct, but it's also very, 
uh, he, he would use the, the essential teaching of the Buddha, the Four Noble Truths. And, and I found these Four Noble Truths really a brilliant teaching, you know, the, the, from the Buddha himself. This was his first sermon after his enlightenment. And so the, Ajahn Chah was very good at getting, uh, because suffering or dukkha is the first noble truth. And, and he recognized, and this is a, a common bond of all humanity. In fact, in Thailand, there are often times when a monk addresses a, a group of people, he would say something like, we are all brothers and sisters in suffering, in old age, sickness, and death. He, these kind of statements are, are quite ordinary you know, amongst, when Thai monks uh, give uh, Dhamma talks. And this was a very good reflection. I never thought of it. Like, who would have dared to address brothers and sisters in old age, sickness, and death? You know, this sounds so depressing. But yet, but yet in terms of, of making suffering into a noble truth, this, is, this was always intrigued me. Because uh, this re other religions don't approach the religious question from this common experience of suffering. And because this is a common experience, then, then it, it's not like personal, it's not like I suffer and others don't. Where from the ego position, I could feel, I used to feel that I was the only one that suffered. And, and they were su surprised to find out other people, people that didn't look like they were suffering, were suffering. Uh, and this suffering then was raised up into a noble truth rather than some horrible reality. You know, some depressing statement about that life is just, you know, suffering uh, and, and then seeing it as, as just something bad about or this, this realm we're in. But placed in the sense of, of a noble truth and it's, it's the awakening. It's that it's suffering, uh, Lumpur Chah used to say, it's the suffering that awakens you. And during this, this, my life with Lumpur Chah, I found that the suffering that I had there, I be def definitely could see I was creating it. And uh, the, this one instance that is in one of my books about uh, every day, once a week we'd have the observance night following the phase of the moon, and before that we'd have to sweep, spend the whole day sweeping the, the monastery and it was a huge place. And so, and we'd have to make these brooms and uh, out of twigs and branches with a bamboo pole. And, and I was, I thought, I don't, I can't be bothered with this. Um, <laughs> this isn't my interest in when I came here. <laughs> and, and so, I, you know, I used to do it because, you know, you're supposed to. And I, and I was, I, you know, I went along with it. But I regarded it as a, a waste of time and something I did uh, under duress, not because I, I really saw the point of it or wanted to do it. So uh, because I never made a, a broom, then I'd, what I'd have to do is find a, a broom that another monk wanted, which <laughs> would usually be something that they'd thrown out already. So it'd usually be a bamboo pole with a couple of little twigs attached to it. <laughs> And so you'd, you'd be sweeping with this, and like scratching the ground. <laughs> where if you know how to make a good broom, uh, the ones that really made good brooms they had these nice springy quality. So you get this, and you could do this kind uh, of magnificent sweeping, you know, and just sweep the leaves like this, and the, and the broom would kind of spring with the leaves, and it wasn't hard work, it was quite pleasurable, if you, if you weren't complaining about it. <laughs> uh, then, one day, and then we had to do this in the afternoon where, and it's very hot, and, and I was out, in, and, and there's this dust that you raise when you're sweeping, so I was in this dust and sweeping with this wretched uh, reject of a broom, <laughs> and, and then uh, I was thinking, you know, the, you know, grumbling, complaining to myself, and, um, and he comes, I see him coming, and he's smiling at me. You know, what are you smiling about? And he's in a really, really grumpy state. And, and then he, he says to me, he says, uh, Tomato, uh, he says, uh, 
what papong? Is it suffering? And then he walks off. <laughs> and so I, it stops me in my tracks. And, and my, my emotional reaction is, it sure is. What papong? <laughs> but I knew that wasn't the right. You know, something in me it suddenly saw what I was doing. And I re recognized that I was creating the suffering. Uh, uh, that what Bapong was, you know, there was heat, it was you had hot weather, and you had dust, and and you had, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, in many ways could be, you know, it was, a, it was a, a, a a difficult way to live, but it wasn't suffering till I started thinking of it in those terms, and I began to see how, you know, how lucky I was in this, I'm living in a community of such good people, for one thing. You know, living with really, really honorous, honorable and monks with integrity and having a wise, living with a wise, enlightened person. And then the lay people, you know, they, when they come to the monastery, they're on their best behavior all the time. So they, they, and they give good food and they, they, they really support us. And, and so I, I just saw that, that actually the, the suffering wasn't uh, around the sweeping or the dust or the weather or the heat, uh, heat or anything like that, it was what I create around these. At least it's the way the world is. If you're living in northeast Thailand, like the monkeys, this is just the way they, the, it is there, you know. To want, uh, in the hot season, want coolness in when you're living in Ubon, waste of time, isn't it? <laughs> uh, because heat is like this, this is just the way it is. Then going to, to England, I remember, uh, in 77, then going to a, a, a cool country, and then, and then I noticed, you know, the mind complaining about how cold it, it is. And so, I, but I learned the lesson, you know, I thought, no, don't complain about it. This is the way England is. This is, this is, this is the way it is. And, and something in me kind of opened and, and, and just accepted it in its own terms uh, and, and, and the way it is, the way the people are uh, because then I could, I could get nostalgic for Thailand thinking uh, I want to go back to Thailand, people show more respect there and then no, don't believe that because this is the, the, to, to, to want something that's not present something you don't have is suffering and to not want what you have is suffering. And this is like the, the, in the Second Noble Truth that Nung Po Cha kept pointing out, this attachment to desire. And just by reflecting on that over and over, and every time you forget it and get caught up in your, in your complaining mind or your critical mind, I kept reminding myself. And this, of course, has, has gotten me through the life uh, uh, in you know, in a way that that I have feel very very good about having lived as a monk for so long because it's given me such a good perspective on suffering and also on non-suffering because it wasn't just suffering Lung Pa was pointing to but non-suffering and how when we do let go, when we can accept life and and not complain and resist and control and blame and when we let go of these tendencies then life is the way it is even you know it has painful moments and it has its pleasures and its miseries but the suffering is around uh, you know me grasping and wanting life to be otherwise so then the liberation is is through trusting in this awareness this mindful ability that we all have to be awake and aware. And, and uh, I think uh, Ajahn Chah was an expert at kind of pointing this out and, and, uh, and guided us through many situations. And then after his, his death, it was, uh, you know, one felt, I felt a confidence uh, because uh, I realized that when I saw Lung Po Cha when he had his stroke, and I felt this incredible grief, and I remember really feeling a really almost unbearable sense of grief and loss, and then 
then I remembered, this is the way it is. <laughs> so I thought, you know, Lung Po Chow would want me to reflect on this rather than, than, than just wallow in, in the sense of loss and, and uh, you know, anguish that, that I would create through not wanting it to be like this, through resenting it, through trying to blame somebody for his death, or, 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 or really feeling that his death is, a, a, you know, a great loss and that I can't bear it. But this also is the teaching is uh, letting go of these habits and and recognizing life is like this. Uh, that which is born dies. Simple common sense, the, the truth and the Dhamma. So I'll stop here. <laughs>